IBESS, Water and Aquatic Food Production Part 4, will examine the uneven access to fresh water across the globe. There are societal reasons why not all of the world's people have access to clean fresh water. Stay tuned. The essential ideas are the hydrological cycle is a system of flows and storages that may be disrupted by human activity. The supplies of freshwater resources are inequitably available and unevenly distributed, which can lead to conflict and concerns over water security. This movie is about access to fresh water resources by the globe's societies. Here is the first of two slides that provide an outline of the movies available in the Water Aquatic Food Production Unit. Use this outline to find the movie you need for review. This movie is focused here. Here is the second slide of the outline of available movies. Use the outline to find the movie you need for review. So, with a diagram of the hydrological cycle, imagine the reasons that access to fresh water varies among peoples of the world. Here are the IB syllabus statements that form the basis of this movie and the two movies prior to this one. This movie is about the uneven access to the world's fresh water. It is not so much about distribution of the world's fresh water. Remember from the last movie that there is plenty of fresh water on earth to satisfy everyone, all 7 billion plus of us. So why does water feel scarce? What are the factors that get in the way of access to fresh water? What are the factors that prevent people from having access to fresh, clean water? All the water here today has always been here. So, water scarcity, what is it all about? Is it just a spatial or temporal unevenness in the distribution? Or is there more to scarcity? We can deconstruct the problem of water accessibility into the following factors. There is uneven spatial and temporal distribution of the world's fresh water. This is a factor, but it's an ecological factor. And then there are the societal factors, sociopolitical, economic, technological, and environmental. We will start with the sociopolitical factor, population size. Access to clean, fresh water depends on how many people there are in a location who need water. And all people need water. The size of the population in a given area with certain fixed storages of water will influence how much is available to each person. For example, China has 21% of the world's population. That's huge, but only 7% of the world's fresh water. That is an ecological constraint mixed with a socio-political constraint in the size of the population. Not only might a location have a lot of people, each of whom requires water, but then the question is, how much does each person demand? What is the standard of living? Washing machines? Flush toilets? Meat-eating habits? If per capita consumption is high, more water is required and some people might not get much. Access to fresh water can be uneven. People need water, and more people need more water. And the more people there are in a certain location, the more likely it is that the access to fresh water is uneven. More than a hundred million people live along the banks of the Yellow River. High densities of people put stress on the available storages of water in that location. While there might be 17,000 liters of fresh water per day per person on a global scale, if people live in high density conditions, as you can see in this image, providing water to everyone evenly can be difficult. Conflict as a socio-political issue also changes the access that certain populations have 
to fresh water. Political conflict often puts certain groups of people at a disadvantage, especially people in poverty. Political conflict increases the divide between who has access to fresh water and who does not. Political conflict often creates high densities of people who have very few resources, including water. Conflict in the Middle East has its roots in the access to water. The Jordan River serves five countries. Access to aquifers, the coast aquifer, and the mountain aquifer shapes the negotiations over Israeli settlements, the boundaries of the West Bank, and the home to the Palestinians. In the early part of the 20th century, the Colorado River Pact guaranteed Mexico nearly 10% of the Colorado River's flow. Today, so much water has been withdrawn from the Colorado River that it only occasionally reaches the ocean. The water Mexico receives from the Colorado River is far short of what international agreements might promise. The Morelos Dam is the last dam on the Colorado River before the river enters Mexico. You can see in this photograph the state of the Colorado River as it enters Mexico. Here's what the Colorado River looks like just 500 kilometers upstream. And here's the river in Mexico. Turkey controls the headwaters of the Tigris and the Euphrates rivers, both of which flow into arid lands, Syria and Iraq. You can see if you look carefully that Turkey has built dams on those rivers. The origin of the conflict between Turkey and Syria and Iraq goes back to the 1960s when Turkey implemented a public works project aimed at harvesting the water from the Tigris and Euphrates rivers through the construction of 22 dams for the purposes of irrigation and hydroelectric energy needs. During drought periods, Iraq and Syria demand that Turkey increase flows. Turkey responds, but only incrementally. This is a perfect example of where water and access to water has led to international conflict. Certainly, a lack of water causes conflict, and conflict changes who has access to water. India controls the headwaters of the Indus River, a river that flows from India into Pakistan. The building of dams in India has angered Pakistan. People in Pakistan protest against the building of dams in India. Let's take a look, albeit a superficial look, at how economics influences access to fresh water. Some people can afford access to water, while others cannot. Water is natural capital that can produce natural income. The flow of water to people as natural income has a cost, and some people have the money to afford adequate fresh water supply, while some people do not have the money for fresh water. Some people can afford to have water piped directly into their homes, as you can see in the upper left image, while some societies provide water fountains in public places, as you can see in the upper right image. And some people rely on a local water truck to bring them water, while some people have to walk long distances each day to get water. As a result of polluted water, water has become more of a commodity. Bottled water has a cost that only some can afford. Our surface water is most often polluted, so clean water is not accessible to everyone. As natural income, a supply of clean water has become expensive, a luxury that some must do without. More economically developed countries use more water than less economically developed countries. Why is that? More economically developed countries have irrigated agriculture, homes have washing machines and flush toilets, 
and there tends to be meat-eating habits in the MEDCs. All of these use more water. Access to fresh water is influenced by cost, poverty, technology, and location. And think about what some people consume per capita consumption. How much do they waste? Do some people take more than their fair share? Do you use a lot of water? Could you use less? Do you use water unnecessarily? And conflict, often over access to resources, increases the difference between those who have access to fresh water and those who don't. Let's look at how technology influences access to fresh water. Access to water may involve technology, technology that some societies have and some societies do not have. This is a well in India. The well is a form of technology that provides access to groundwater. Access to deep groundwater requires technology, and this hand-operated pump is more technology than some societies have, like the society seen in the slide previous to this one. The combustion engine seen in this image drives the withdrawal of deep groundwater in more economically developed countries. How does the fossil fuel-driven technology change access to water and food? For our densely populated cities, where does the water come from for all of these people? And how much does each person consume? Even when water is not available in a specific location, societies have the technology to move the water to those locations. The technology to build dams serves to hold water back, and this potentially makes water available for irrigation and domestic use. And lastly, let's look at how environmental issues influence access to fresh water. Polluted water makes fresh water less accessible to societies. I, I hope that that's clear. Almost everywhere, people make clean water unavailable water due to pollution. Societies have different values for the natural income of water flow, but water is required for all living organisms. Water is required for life. We need to value clean water more. And how much money must we spend to clean water that we've polluted? And how much must we spend to buy clean drinking water in a bottle? What technology is required? Over the last 40 slides, I've covered the uneven access to the world's fresh water with an attempt to organize the information along the lines of politics, economics, technology, and the environment. Let me look at a few additional thoughts on the access to water in bringing this movie to a close. Irrigating farmland consumes more water than any other human activity that consumes water. Certain societies, MEDCs in particular, have access to the technology to irrigate in the manner you see in these photos, but also consider the evaporative loss from the surfaces in these photos. What are the water consumption patterns of certain societies? Bottled water, flush toilets, irrigated golf courses, and household water taps. These are the luxury of the wealthy. Some societies rely on the government to provide water that's distributed by truck. Do you think the homes of these people have flush toilets or faucets? Obviously not. Meat production requires far more water than growing vegetable crops. Meat-eating societies are larger consumers of water than vegetarian societies. Here are the water requirements in liters for various human activities. Notice that growing one kilogram of wheat requires 300 liters of water. Remember, I've been saying all along how much water agriculture requires but one kilogram of beef requires 6,000 liters, 
one kilogram of milk requires 10,000 liters. And consider the industrial use of water to manufacture an automobile. And then imagine the city of Las Vegas, a city built in the desert that pretends to have lots and lots of water. Consider the intersection of culture and economics and technology and ecology. Or Hollywood, which is also located in a desert biome. Southern California gets water by pipeline from the mountains to the north or by canal from the Colorado River to the east. Yet people enjoy pools, despite how precious water is. And some people have very little water and take very little. Consider the intersection of ecology, the dry biome, technology, access to groundwater, and economics, poverty, and population growth, where densely populated areas are places with added stress on water systems. And then there's Dubai, with almost no surface water whatsoever, but the money to buy whatever resource is required. In this movie, I've explained the dynamic nature of water as a resource across space and time, but with a focus on the uneven access to the world's fresh water. In the next movie, I will describe and evaluate water enhancement measures that provide for increasing demand for fresh water by societies. And that brings IBESS Water and Aquatic Food Production Part 4 to an end.